Maybe. Yeah? You think we're gonna go to hell? Maybe we're gonna go to purgatory. Or maybe heaven. Well, we're gonna do that in the Divine Comedy. Wait, what? Okay, Ian has the video set up. And Ian, start the video. Okay. Heaven and hell have long fascinated writers, poets, and all us other flaky artistic types with our heads in the clouds, or, as the person varies, several kilometers underground and on fire. But there's one iconic text that has essentially <laughs> served as a hitchhiker's guide to hell for nearly The travelers years. got hell. It's written by That's one funny. Dante Alighieri. It's called The Divine Comedy, but most people only ever care about the first third of it, descriptively titled The Inferno, which is actually a rather odd title because only part of hell is actually on fire at any given time. Really? The worst bits I don't know that. Like, but I digress. The thing to be aware of about The Inferno before we start looking at it is that it's basically Dante's self-insert historical fan fiction in which he gets to team up with his role model slash celebrity boy crush Virgil and watch all his Is that what we're doing in collab? Need to remember is that Dante was Italian, I don't AKA know. Roman, AKA he really didn't like the Greeks that much, especially Ooh. not the ones responsible for the destruction of Troy. Greeks so are good. I like their heroes. I'm seeing gyros. Our story opens mm. with our dude Dante wandering around this super sketchy forest at the base of a mountain, specifically Mount Delectable. Sadly, Ooh, this is not food. actually a mountain of infinite candy, but is instead a symbolic mm. representation of heaven, which I guess could hypothetically be a mountain of infinite candy, but somehow I feel that my dentist would disagree with my analysis. Having nothing better to do, Dante tries to climb this mountain, only to find that because he is somehow unworthy, his progress is blocked by a ferocious panther, a lion, and a she-wolf. And then Virgil shows up. For those who don't know, Virgil is this ancient Roman poet who, among other things, wrote the Aeneid, and Dante just happens to be his number one fan. So Virgil's hey. like, looks like you're too lame to go to heaven. Sup, nerd. So your dead girlfriend Beatrice has sent me to help toughen you up. And Dante's like, <gasps> First they come oh, no. to a gate with a long complicated inscription that ends in the now iconic line Abandon and all hope ye who enter, enter here. here. So Virgil's like, Alright, Dante, welcome to hell. And Dante's like, Hey, why do I hear so much screaming? And Virgil's like, I said welcome to hell, idiot. What part of that was unclear? So hell is unsupposedly oh. pretty intense. There's dudes getting bit by bugs, stung by hornets, all that good stuff. And we're not I would not want to be yet. stung by hornets. The river, Akron, yeah. We're going shopping. On the way over, Dante passes out from the awkwardness and wakes up on the other side of the river in the first circle of hell. So the first circle of hell isn't really hell either. It's more like diet hell. It's officially diet hell. What? Do they have diet soda there too? Back in the day, the big J himself came down and airlifted some worthy souls up into heaven. Anyway, Dante and Virgil continue on their merry way and run into a welcoming party. <laughs> Ovid and Lucan, a veritable dead poet society, you could say. Anyway, Dante gets to hang out with all the cool dead poets just like he's always yes. dreamed. Almost seems like wish fulfillment, huh? Also chilling in limbo are a bunch of heroes from classic Roman history, including Hector, Aeneas, Caesar, and a few others. So Dante and Virgil move on from limbo and arrive at the second circle of hell, which is guarded by two Minos who judges every soul that enters. How many Virgil is Dante's gift to hell free card, so he avoids the judging eyes of Judgy McJudge face and gets to enter <laughs> the second circle freely. Lucky him. So the second circle is rather really windy and dark, and this wind, in fact, is the punishment for those souls in the second circle who are sent there because of their lustfulness. So what? unsurprisingly, it's filled to the brim with beauty? some of history's sexiest ladies, along with Paris and Achilles for some reason. Yeah, uh, I'm not gonna lie, of all the potential eternal punishments someone could suffer, I'd say rooming with Cleopatra and Helen of Troy forever is hands down the one I'd pick. So yeah. Dante faints again because, as previously stated, the dude's a total wimp. Although he wakes up shortly thereafter and they head off to the third circle, where it rains all the time as a sort of environmental punishment for gluttony. I... I don't really get this punishment, honestly. I mean, rain is uncomfortable, but I don't get how it symbolically connects. Yeah, so I hate rain. So move on to the circle, which is guarded by Plutus, who's generally I mean, considered I like to be it. the Greek god of wealth, but is here been downgraded to the much less impressive status connected. of the prison warden of the fourth circle of hell, where greed is punished. And the fourth circle is pretty weird, even by hell standards. The souls that end up here are forced to roll huge rocks at each other in some weird, inefficient parody of jousting. And this sounds less like a hellish punishment and more like an activity from my middle school gym class. Wait. Bad example. The weirdness uh, seems to get to Dante and Virgil too, who zip sucked. off to the river Styx, which is apparently between the fourth and sixth circles of hell, rather than around mm. the borders of Hades. Who knew? So the Styx, aka the fifth circle of hell, is home to a continuous underwater fist fight between all the souls who sing as rap, while those suffering from that seem like and sullenness just kind of sing. I would win every fist fight because I can just punch so people in the face. Carried across the Styx by this grumpy devil named Phlegius, and after you a brief interruption me? where Dante is accosted by yes. some dude sort of knows, and uh, side note, Damn, this happens a lot, hurt. by the way. I'm skipping over most of that. So they are. Arrive at the far shore of the yes, Styx and start approaching okay. the city of Dis, okay. where the bottom four circles are located. The 
primary yeah. department yeah. feature of DIS Thanks. is that it's almost entirely on fire, okay. and that it's guarded by some extremely grumpy fallen angels who really don't feel oh, like no. Dante and Virgil all up in their city. Virgil tries to talk them down and ends up getting set upon by the Furies for his oh, no. In my experience, this is how most bureaucratic processes end up. So the Furies threaten to sick the Medusa on our dynamic duo, oh, and no. Virgil covers Dante's eyes to protect him, <laughs> when a literal day of sex machina appears in the form of a friendly angel sent from the big man himself. This way. It's a charming place, really. So Dante chats with a couple of flaming coffin residents. Who aren't super They're stoked. in fire. <laughs> Get it? They should be dying. Fire. I'll see myself out. So at this point, they're nearing the bottom levels of hell. So the circles are getting mm. a lot smaller and closer together. And Virgil warns Dante that they've also entered the bad neighborhood part of hell. Well, we should be better be gear up. Talk to any of the souls of I guess. Virgil also explains that the seventh circle is reserved for the violent, which is a staggeringly broad category, as it includes people who defy God by blaspheming or defiling nature. And yes, I choose to interpret defiling nature as a broad category, including but not limited do to do that? Anyway, Virgil and Dante no. run into the Mentor, who inexplicably guards the seventh circle and is even more inexplicably sporting about letting them pass. And it's not just the Minotaur. The Seventh Circle is overall actually pretty cheerful from the get-go, full of ah, friendly centaurs who aren't even like punished that. for anything. They're holding down stable jobs now, and all they have to do to get that monthly paycheck is to shoot arrows at any unfortunate souls that manage to escape the boiling river of blood. Yeah, I forgot about that. This is <gasps> hell, after all. So yeah, the aforementioned river of blood is full okay. of the violent conquerors of the yeah. past, including Alexander the Great, Attila the Hun, and some bloke Dionysius. Not to be confused with the perpetually drunk-slash-hungover Greek deity Dionysus. Eh. Anyway, the friendly centaurs help them across the river, eh. and they end up in a terrifying forest full of poison thorns and harpies. Yay! Help me! Ah! Forest, all the trees used to be people. Yes, this is the proverbial suicide forest, where everyone who commits violence against themselves ends up. Yep, the seventh circle of hell has just been a barrel of laughs so far. So Dante returns the leaves to one of the trees, and they go on their merry way. Things start to heat up when they get to the innermost part of the seventh circle, a giant desert where it continually rains fire, reserved especially for <sighs> the blasphemers and people who don't pick up their trash. Dante runs into an old teacher yeah. who's really only in hell because yeah. he's not exactly the straightest crayon in the box but he's still a really swell dude so they have a nice little reunion and then dante and virgil continue on to the edge of the eighth circle which is unfortunately a giant impassable cliff but luckily for our heroes garion a friendly neighborhood monster shows up and kindly drags them down into the depths of hell Lucky them. so dante and virgil arrive in the eighth circle of hell reserved for people who commit fraud of various kinds this part of hell is officially called the malibolge and it's much closer to the classic fire and brimstone hell than most of what we've seen so far in the outermost ring of the eighth circle nasty looking demons torment the souls here with scourges among several others jason hero of the story of the argonauts is inexplicably stuck in this circle supposedly because he seduced a couple ladies on his way to win the golden fleece but honestly he's most likely really there because dante just really dislikes all greek heroes like yeah, all of them yeah. more on that later farther mm. into the circle is reserved for people who sell religious positions for money there's a word for that but who cares where such sinners are unceremoniously dumped headfirst into holes and have their feet set off oh i see it i remember seeing that on a cover two other still living pokes of also being guilty of crimes one can almost get the impression really? that dante didn't like these popes yeah. that much having consigned them all to hell in his personal self-insert historical crack fic onwards and upwards or maybe downwards mm, the next part okay. of the eighth circle the sinners here are all sorcerers astrologers and false prophets and everyone here has been punished by having their heads twisted around backwards dante's like no how horrible mm. and virgil's like why how dare you pity dead dudes they wouldn't be here if they didn't have it coming and in this part of hell we find yet another of our I got you. heroes in this case the prophet Teresius, who for the crime of Thanks. being blessed with the gift of prophecy by apollo himself is that his head snapped backwards forever in the eighth circle of hell Am what? I the only one who finds this stunningly unfair? Next, Dante yeah, Virgil comes to a lake of boiling tar reserved exclusively for that special wicked breed of man, politicians. This part of hell is a nasty breed of demon called the Malabranch, one of whom pops up unexpectedly and drops a politician into the tar lake, scaring Ow. Virgil and terrifying poor Dante. Virgil makes Dante hide, and then goes out to try and persuade the demons to let them pass, which they do, and they even offer to guide our intrepid duo across the tar lake. On the way, Dante encounters various politicians he especially dislikes, which the Malabranch are kind enough to pull out of the tar lake so they can talk to him. Of course, being demons, the Malabranch take the opportunity to shred the unfortunate politicians with tooth and claw. Mm. And unfortunately, one such politician escapes and dives back into the boiling tar. And when the demons try and grab him again, they get stuck themselves. Hilarious, right? It's classic routines like this that make this text such a classic comedy. So Virgil and Dante try and it sneak away from the now pissed off demons, but they don't get that far before the Malabranch decide that the politician's escape was somehow Dante's fault okay. and start pursuing them. Virgil scoops up Dante and slides out of danger into the next part of the Eighth Circle, where the hypocrites go when they die. Everyone here gets to wear a big fancy gilded lead cloak forever. Get it? 
Is it symbolic of their worthlessness? Ah, and just about the only interesting guy here is the one who was responsible for getting the Big J crucified, one Caiaphas. So they hike over to the next part of the Eighth Circle, which is so far proving to be the largest and the most complicated of all the circles we've seen so far. Anyway, this particular charming locale can be best described as a giant pit full of magical snakes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hell, remember? So this particular snake pit is actually somehow worse than your average run-of-the-mill snake pit because these snakes have a magic bite that transforms you into a random, wacky, and or horrifying creature and or household object. Oh, and this section of hell is devoted to thieves, see? And it's symbolic because they're robbed of their true forms and stuff. Anyway, they go on a little yeah. farther into hell and get to the part of the Eighth Circle where people who abuse you their positions of power and commit fraud right? go. Everyone rooming down here is provided with their own personal bubble of fire, mm -hmm. which honestly sounds pretty cozy. But here's the thing. You saw my thunder sound. Dante huh. is Italian and therefore solidly on the side of the yes. Romans in terms of history. Evie. And, uh, Unfortunately, the Trojan War was won by trying the, to be the Greek side, while the Trojan survivors went off no. and founded Rome or something. So Dante's got some kind of ancestral hate okay. on for all these legendary Greek heroes, especially those directly involved in the Trojan War. And that is why my dudes Odysseus and Diomedes are eternally burning in the eighth circle of hell what? for that this adventure with the Trojan horse. Yeah, I find okay. this incredibly unfair, especially considering the Odyssey. Hasn't yeah. the poor guy suffered enough by now? I so can't Dante believe that, that the Odyssey people... Were suffering. Why? Why, Virgil? Why? It's Dante, you dumb dumb. Like I'm doing purgatory. Let's go. When last we left our intrepid <laughs> protagonist, Diamond had just emerged from hell and out into purgatory. Here, for those unfamiliar with the location, souls that are unworthy to go to heaven but not bad enough dudes to deserve hell purge themselves of their mortal sins so they it's can become a to go to heaven. So, purgatory is a mountain, or more specifically, oh. an island in the I of the train hemisphere on the opposite side of the world to Italy. And fun fact, Dante at this point in history had no idea that the Americas were a thing. So purgatory was proudly declared to be the only landmass in that part of the world, oh, the enlightened world in which we live. Anyway, purgatory is structured as follows. You start at the bottom, climb up through seven terraces corresponding to the seven deadly sins, and when yeah, you get to the top of the mountain, you go to heaven. The well, terraces of purgatory vary wildly between mildly uncomfortable and hellishly terrifying, which is also a pretty accurate model for the overall tone of the book. Purgatory is solidly between heaven and hell, so it makes sense that it'd be a little inconsistent in tone. So our story begins with Dante and Virgil at the bottom of the mountain, chatting with this old dude, Cato, whose job it is to direct the noobs in the right direction. Cato is rather curious as to how exactly the two of them busted out of hell and Virgil's like no it's cool his dead girlfriend sent us and Cato's like ah young love and lets them through while they're there a boat full of new dead dudes show up and purgatory not being burned got, in an overabundance of brought signs, noobs. the new guys immediately get lost Cato's like pardon me duty calls and starts hurting them in the right direction right, so Dante and Virgil move on to the lowest 
part of purgatory, specifically anti-purgatory, where the people who aren't quite Christian enough to go to heaven have to wait another lifetime's worth of years before they can advance up the mountain to the first terrace. It's boring, but at least it's pretty. Dante and Virgil chill out with this dude, Sordello, who's a Mantuan just like Virgil. Sordello tells them that purgatory has only one rule, and it's not, don't talk about purgatory. <laughs> it's impossible Bike to climb the when the sun goes down. You can only advance through purgatory during the day. So, Dante and Virgil spend the night in this gorgeous valley in anti-purgatory, where all the souls sing kumbaya or whatever. And the next morning, mm -hmm. Dante wakes up at the gates of purgatory proper. According Ooh. to Virgil, as soon as the sun rose, some angelic lady showed up and carried the sleeping Dante up here. Hey, easier than walking. Anyway, the gate is guarded by an angel who takes his big honking sword and uses it to carve seven peas into Dante's forehead. One for each terrace. That is hardcore. What? Dante should be on an album cover. Anyway, as he climbs through the mountain, the peas will be erased what? one by one as he passes through the terraces. See, it's symbolic of him losing his sins as he climbs up to heaven and... Ah, whatever. If you wanted an in-depth symbolic analysis, you'd be over on Spark Notes right now. So the angel unlocks the gate. I two want to be on Spark Notes right now. Symbolism, totally symbolism. And Dante and Virgil he are wants to be on Spark Notes. One side right note before we continue. Quiet. Similarly to the Inferno, Dante is kind of a rock star in the eyes of the souls of Purgatory, being lucky enough to get the guided tour of the afterlife while not being dead. So he's routinely accosted by people he knows or has heard of, and because this is a near constant thing, I'm skipping over most of that because who wants to hear me read the 14th century equivalent of the phone book? So the first terrace is devoted to pride, and the souls. In this terrace are weighed down oh, by huge yeah. stones that force them to bow. Symbolism. Now yeah, there are a few symbolism. more differences between purgatory and hell. Well. I mean, there are a lot Duh. of differences between purgatory and hell, but the relevant one in this case is that in purgatory, the terraces are filled with examples of the good side of humanity. And in this terrace, this is displayed through statues and carvings representing humility. Lady. So while the souls are going through suffering and climbing the mountain, they're also seeing what they'll become after they strip their sins away. They're also all singing for some reason. And in my experience, singing while climbing mountains makes the climbing more difficult, but whatever. Symbolism. Anyway, Virgil mentions that Dante's a pretty proud dude, and Dante contemplates how much time he's likely going to have to spend in this terrace when he finally kicks the bucket so they reach the edge of the terrace and the angel of humility pops up and magically erases one of the peas from dante's forehead now it's on to terrace number two the terrace of envy here disembodied voices talk about the great benefits of generosity but unlike in the first terrace there are no visual aids to accompany the soundtrack no statues carvings none of that the reason for this becomes clear when we see that the souls in this terrace have their eyes sewn shut <laughs> Purgatory isn't all fun and games. Dante and Virgil I'm out, I'm out, I'm out. I'm out. Terrace, the yeah, and you got, pops up and you the got to do this. Forehead. So Dante okay. and Virgil go to the third terrace with the corresponding sin of wrath. In contrast with the unsettlingly horrifying nature of the previous terrace's punishment, this one is just swathed in a blinding acrid mist. Dante has a brief convo with one of the souls here about the nature of free will, and then he and Virgil reach the edge of the terrace. The angel of peace erases the third pea from Dante's face, and they continue on. But before they reach the fourth terrace, Virgil teaches Dante about love. <laughs> It's because the next four terraces are all about sins that are messed up forms of love. That is, sloth, greed, gluttony, and lust. Here, sloth is defined as insufficient love. So in terrace number four, sloth is purged through rigorous use of middle school gym class punishment tactics. That is, running in circles forever. So the sun goes down, and Dante has a dream about a hideous siren who entrances him with a song, but he is snapped out of it by some other lady. And then Virgil wakes him up, and they move on to the gate of the fifth terrace, where the angel of zeal erases the fourth pea from Dante's forehead. And then they pass through to the fifth terrace, where okay. greed is purged. So on this terrace, all the souls here are, well, stuck lying face down on the ground. Given that this punishment involves being unable to move, I have no idea how you're supposed to be able to climb past this terrace, but there's no time to ponder that because suddenly there's an earthquake and everybody starts singing. What is happening? Anyway, then they notice that someone else is climbing a mountain behind them. His name is Statius, by the way, and Virgil asks him what was up with the quake. Statius is like, oh, well, you see, purgatory isn't affected by normal tectonic or climactic events. Here, we have earthquakes every time a soul finishes up here and is ready to go to heaven. And Virgil's like, huh. So who's the lucky guy? And Statues is like, it's all me, baby. So anyway, our dynamic duo continue upward towards the sixth right, terrace buddy. where the angel of justice erases the fifth pea from Dante's forehead. And then it's on to the terrace of gluttony where Dante straight up rips off Tantalus's punishment for the penance of this circle. Here, gluttons starve in a forest of fruit trees where all the fruit is just out of reach. Dante's more confused about how dead people can even starve since they don't have to eat anymore. And Virgil's like, don't ask stupid questions. Yeah, you know the drill. Dante talks to some dudes, gets to the gate, the angel of temperance erases a pee from his yeah, face, and they move on. The seventh terrace is lost, and it mixes up the formula last a little bit. One, with enormous last one, more, one more thing. So yeah, the relevant souls are in this wall of fire, just kind of chilling. <laughs> and again, they're baffled by Dante's aliveness. Dante talks with a few of these lusty dudes, and then Virgil's like, okay, now we need to walk into the fire. And Dante's like, excuse you? And Virgil's like, come on, don't wimp out on me now. And 
Dante's like, there is no way I'm going to set myself on fire for your amusement. And Virgil's like, oh, then I guess you don't want to see your dead girlfriend. So Dante and Virgil take a stroll through the fire. When they get to the other side, the angel of purity erases the last pee from Dante's forehead. The sun sets and Dante falls asleep and then has yet another symbolism laden dream about women. Man, this guy really needs a girlfriend. But yeah, the women in question are Leah and Rachel, two biblical ladies who represent the active Christian lifestyle or something. Anyway, Dante wakes up and he and Virgil head onward to the last part of purgatory, the earthly paradise at the very top of the mountain. Wait, did I say Dante and Virgil? See, the thing is, Virgil can't really guide him any further, mostly because he still technically belongs in hell. Fortunately mm. for all of us, this doesn't mean he has to mm. leave. He can still go with Dante, he just won't be guiding him anymore. So Dante makes it up to the earthly paradise, the very top of purgatory. Unsurprisingly, the earthly paradise is gorgeous and lovely and pretty much the best thing ever. In the earthly mm. paradise, Dante and Virgil find a lady, Matilda, who starts guiding them through the earthly paradise, where they see a procession of a colorful array of characters that we don't really care about because, oh dang, look who's with them, it's Beatrice! Yes, that's right, Dante's dead girlfriend is finally here! Yay! But Virgil's oh. gone. No! Beatrice is like, quit crying. This is supposed to be a place of fun. Turns out Beatrice is also pissed at Dante because after she died, he, get this, fell in love with someone else. Because oh nobody God. can be as gorgeous as Beatrice. This is something Dude, sin. why? Why, why did you fall in love with place. someone it's else? A joke about jealous ex-girlfriends here. Dante's still crying, of course, so Beatrice has her four handmaidens push him into the river Lethe to calm him down and also purge his memories of sin, but who cares about that? So Dante emerges from the Lethe and Beatrice finally reveals her face, which is so entrancingly gorgeous that Dante forgets to blink for a while. Then there's some business with the Tree of Knowledge and Dante passes out. When he wakes up, he scoots on over to Beatrice, who's chilling under the Tree of Knowledge, and Beatrice is like, okay, some crazy stuff is about to go down take notes okay so this is pretty weird what? so pay attention yeah. first off there's this chariot right okay. it's tied to the tree of knowledge griffin put it there nobody cares okay keep your eye on this chariot boom suddenly eagle eagle smacks into the chariot and twists it into a pretzel next up hungry fox jumps into the chariot beatrice punches it eagle oh. back. this time it molts all over the chariot then the ground splits open and a goddamn dragon shows up a dragon the chariot type. drags a chunk of it back underground okay so that was weird. Then what the chariot happened? girl's four heads turns into a giant and a prostitute, and then the giant drags the prostitute off. Purgatory's Hi. weird. So Beatrice spits out a prophecy that somehow explains everything. I don't get it. Neither does the internet. And they push Dante into another river, which restores uh -huh. his good memories. At this point, he's all set to head on over to heaven. Or something. I will be doing the Paradise Show. All right, here we go. The final one. The final part of this trilogy of books. When last we left our intrepid adventurers, Dante and his dead girlfriend had just witnessed some really trippy symbolism-laden nonsense, and it's only ascended to heaven, like you do. Hey. Dante starts us off by telling us Yay. that God shines light everywhere, Yay, but mostly God. in heaven, which is where he is right now. This is, incidentally, why heaven is bright. Like, really bright. Take oh. this brightness, as it is something of a theme in this book. He's so, getting a... Fact, when Dante he says heaven, he basically means space. I understand the confusion that means up from the perspective of Earth. So they leave Earth behind, and Beatrice starts him on a guided tour of the celestial spheres. That is, the 14th century model of the solar system, which looks something like this. Yeah. And here's something for your literary analysis. Motion is a huge theme in the Divine Comedy. In Hell, nothing ever changes. While in Purgatory, upward motion is the single goal. But in Heaven, time is everything always forever, and it's full of spirits buzzing around like ten-year-olds mm. jacked up on pixie sticks. So anyway, the first planet they go to is the moon, which uh, is the planet. And Beatrice I've always is like, had Dante, those. everything the light touches is God's kingdom. And Dante's like, what about that shadowy place? And Beatrice Thank is like, you, oh, Reverend. it's fascinating, actually. It's not darker because it's farther away. The light's a funny thing, see? Science nonsense. It's dark because God said so. So anyway, the spirits of the dead that get yeah. to hang out on the moon are those who were inconstant, just like the moon. Oh yeah, that crazy moon. Always orbiting the Earth in that unpredictable elliptical pattern while the sun... Sun's light reaches it at an increasing angle in relation to the Earth, consequently leading to its regularly changing phases. And it's so crazy, you never know what it's gonna be. You're me. Chats with this lady, Picarda, who's glowing so much she's having trouble recognizing her. And she mm. talks about how when she was alive, she was a nun who was taken from her convent. It's cool, though. She gets to chill on the moon forever. So that's... Good. Well, hey, the next episode of Magic School Bus is our tour of Mercury. Now, Mercury's mm, pretty close to the sun, which means it's, surprise, surprise, too bright to see. So Dante gets to chill with all the heaven-bound souls who were a little too ambitious when they were alive. I'd say it's because they flew too close to the sun. But it's actually because the glory they earned on Earth pales in significance to the glory of God, just like Mercury pales next to the sun because it's too goddamn bright. Dante also hangs out with Emperor Justinian, who's 
A guide? Some 5th century Byzantine yeah. emperor, I guess. Part of what makes these texts difficult to read nowadays is that Dante gave yeah, cameos to all his pals and favorite historical figures, only a few of whom we still actually care about today. Ah, and so the sands of time wear down on us all. But who cares? Yeah. Certainly not us. Dante's yeah. off to Venus. And to hey, his credit, Dante gets one thing right about Venus. It's very cloudy. But these are nice, sedate, cool clouds that don't rain acid down on the barren hellscape mm. below. No, this Venus is where the lovers go. It's lovely, peaceful, devoid of greenhouse gases and acid lakes, and surprise, surprise. Extremely bright. Anyway, Dante talks to this troubadour who takes the opportunity to take a big old dump on Florence, blaming it for everything wrong with the clergy. Uh, for those keeping score, that's so far a handful of popes and one major city that Dante's blaming for the sorry state of the church. Mm. On to the fourth Damn. heaven, which is the sun. Wee. What? What happened to Mars? Why is oh, this path so what? efficient? If you Why, were Mercury, Why you are you going to, go to the sun Venus now? You went to the sun. Even the magic school bus visited the planets in order, and they did that in a bus. Yeah. Anyway, the sun is bright, no kidding. Dante takes a moment to appreciate the craftsmanship before being surrounded by 12 glowy spheres, mm -hmm. each the soul of an extremely wise dude. And then they move on to Mars. Finally, Jesus. Finally, anyway, we're right on the right planet. The, the faith, people who died for God. Hey, I wonder if that means Jesus is here. Yeah. You know, I'm sure he's got a special share somewhere. Anyway, all the glowing souls on Mars are assembled in the shape of a Greek cross, which Google Images tells me is basically a plus sign trying to be an individual. Dante compares yeah, the cross yeah. to the Milky Way, which tells me that he's either never looked up at the sky or he's finally been blinded by all the goddamn lens yeah. flare. Anyway, Dante runs into an ancestor of his with an unpronounceable name, who tells him to write all this stuff down. He also bumps into Judah Maccabee. For those of you unfamiliar, he's relevant to the story of Hanukkah, yeah. along with Charlemagne and a few others. Then it's on to Jupiter, and here's where it starts to get weird. Yeah. So, first of all, as soon as Dante and Beatrice get there, the souls yeah. start putting on a living fireworks display and spell out the latin words these things Ugh. i can't read anyway, latin i don't, like oh, I don't know oh i don't know percy jackson and while the other souls scatter and then it gets really big and bright and, and apparently stands for monarcha aka monarch aka jesus pro tip when analyzing Ooh. parody so everything is jesus anyway then yeah to a giant eagle which dante chats with for a while it is exactly as weird as it sounds also the eagle was probably jesus so they move on to saturn which is really bright it's where the uh, contemplatives end up which is interesting oh my god what a conversation Amazing fact. Everything is bright. Of course it is. Symbolic of their ascension closer to God. This is also Symbolism. why the spheres keep getting brighter. Anyway, they climb up this golden ladder, Jacob's ladder apparently, and ascend into the eighth heaven, ladder. circle of the fixed stars. I'm so, not Jacob. Astronomy lesson. The fixed stars are an antiquated concept that defined the celestial bodies that didn't seem to move in relation to each other. The things that did move, namely the planets and your occasional asteroid, were designated as wandering stars. The fixed stars were supposedly on the inside of a giant celestial sphere with the Earth at its center, and in fact, they served as the outermost layer of the geocentric model of the solar system. So anyway, Dante climbed the ladder into space. This sphere is just full of saints you because it's basically... We are already in just short of Jesus. Space. One of the dudes here, St. Peter, as it turns out, pushes around Beatrice a few times and then starts arguing with Dante over what faith is. Dante's like, well, see, faith is when you hope something will happen even though you have no evidence to support it. And St. Peter's like, awesome, and poops off. And St. James okay. asks him what hope is. And Dante's like, oh, hope is an expectation of good stuff that God gives you if you're good. And St. James is like, great, and poops off. But then, horror of horrors, Beatrice vanishes. Or maybe Dante's finally gone blind from all the lens flare. Actually, mm. that turns out to be exactly what happened. So Dante's blind, and then St. John shows up and asks him to explain love and Dante's like, well, let's mm -hmm. And that's why gardens are just the best Then Beatrice cures Dante's blindness by wait for it, shining some really bright light into his eyes. On her BS so The man the is already blind a We'll never Anyway, now that Dante can see again, he notices a really bright light. And Beatrice is like, yeah, that's Adam, as in Adam and Eve. Let's go say hello. No. So they go over, and Adam's like, let me stop you right there, because I know what you're about to ask me. Before you ask what? about all that, it's because I'm literally psychic. God wasn't mad because I ate the fruit, he was mad because I broke the rules. I was in Eden for all of seven hours. It's been 6,498 years since I got kicked out. And the language I spoke is long dead because 6,000 years have passed. You really get the impression okay. that Adam has heard it all before, and he's like one of those really jaded celebrities who just does not have time for his fans anymore. <laughs> anyway, so Dante, the writer, not his self-insert, takes a minute to take a dump on the current Pope. So the five souls he's talked to so far, Beatrice, St. Peter, St. James, St. John, and Adam, all start glowing really brightly, and then, mm. bang, shock, St. Peter turns red. This is apparently because on Earth, Pope Boniface is apparently just doing an awful job at being Pope. It's so bad that God himself is bummed, and the entire rest of heaven turns red as a result. Mm. Talk about theatrical. 
Speaking of theatrics, St. Peter is so incensed by all this corrupt papacy that he starts ranting about evil popes and orders Dante to write about how terrible they are so everybody knows. So anyway, Dante looks back at Earth and his newly unblinded eyes let him see it in insane detail. He even sees the route Odysseus took during the Odyssey and the island of Crete, which is impressive because Crete is tiny, even by island standards. And Beatrice has once again become even more beautiful. As it turns out, this is because they're getting closer to the Prima Mobile, the last physical circle of heaven and the realm of the angels. So Dante sees a really bright light, shocker, which is orbited by nine rings of light. The smallest ring has the purest light, which Dante thinks is because it's closest to the other light. There was a whole lot of light in that mm -hmm. sentence. Incidentally, the light at the center of that is the tenth circle of heaven. We'll get to that. Anyway, Beatrice is like, yeah, that ring is spinning fastest because it's the holiest and closest to God, and it's spurred on by love. And Dante's like, yeah, that's cool and all, but doesn't that imply that the earth would be the holiest of all the heavenly circles because it's smallest? And Beatrice is like, no, see, because in this universe, the better something is, the bigger it is. Anyway, the nine rings are representative oh of the angelic hierarchy, which is pretty fascinating all on its own. So here's how that goes. The smallest ring and the top tier of the angels are the seraphim. Seraphim literally translates to burning one, and they're traditionally represented with three sets of wings. Confusingly, seraph is also sometimes used in the Bible to refer to snakes. Man, the Bible just cannot be asked to keep its terminology straight. Yeah. This is that Satan mess all over again. The second ring are the cherubim, and let me stop you right there, because you just thought of a pudgy little baby with wings and a trumpet, and boy are you no, wrong. Again. Cherubim are four-faced monstrosities with four wings covered in eyeballs, which sounds less like something that would decorate a Valentine's Day card and more like a boss in Dark Souls. That baby thing you thought of is actually called a puto, by the way. The third ring are the thrones, which are bizarre, even by heaven standards. They're wheels, specifically two wheels, one nested inside the other, and they're also covered in eyeballs for some okay. reason. Why? Also, I think they're on fire. The fourth ring are the dominions, which are blessedly normal looking for angels. They're divinely beautiful yes, dudes with big feathery yawning. wings. The fifth ring are the virtues, which I couldn't find a description for, but apparently they glow. Shocker, right? The sixth ring are the powers, which are warrior angels. The seventh ring are the principalities, which are traditional-ish angels. They carry scepters and wear crowns because they're basically rulers of certain groups of people and it's kind of confusing so next the eighth ring are the yeah. archangels and i want you to do me a favor and forget everything you think you know about archangels because they are much less cool than you think they are archangels yeah. are just slightly better than plain vanilla angels and angels are just messengers they're the highest class of angel but not the highest class of angel you know what forget it and then the ninth ring are just your standard plain vanilla angels Next up, it's time for a history lesson. Beatrice oh. tells Dante that in the beginning, God made form and matter, and also a combination of the two, in a big flash of light, and that's how he created the universe. Almost yeah. immediately thereafter, Lucifer took it into his head to rebel, and as a result, was cast down to the lowermost butthole of the universe, Earth. After all that mess was taken care of, the rest of the angels started spinning around God in these nine concentric rings, and they haven't stopped since. And now what? it's on to the tenth sphere, the Empyrean. This is where it starts getting weird, because here's where we transcend the physical universe and get a look at the face of God. First off, the Empyrean oh, yeah. is a I'm to see light, God. all those other heavens which are just really bright all the time. Anyway, the first thing Dante runs into is a river of light, which Beatrice tells him to drink from. He takes a swig, and that's when stuff gets really weird. So basically, this magic glowy water lets him see the Empyrean for what it truly is. And it's possibly the weirdest thing ever. First of all, the river goes from straight to round, and all the glowy flowers and gems around it turn into a bunch of angels and saints. Dante also notices a bright light high above him, as well as an enormous rose for some reason. The rose is full of the souls who were so righteous and awesome that they get to chillax right next to God. There's a seat mm. reserved especially for King Henry the Seventh, not the one who ended the War of the Roses, the German one who was Holy Roman Emperor for like a year because Dante believed he was going to unite Italy or something. This didn't end up happening. Gotta wonder if they kept his seat open. Anyway, there are a whole bunch of angels flying around the rose, distributing love all over it like bees pollinating a flower. That's not my metaphor, by the way. So Dante's very impressed, and he goes to talk to Beatrice about it when, shock, Beatrice is gone! And it's mm, not because he's gone blind again. She's been replaced by some old guy. So Dante channels his inner Batman and goes all, where is she? And the old guy's like, whoa, hey, chill out, dude. Have you tried looking up? So yeah, Beatrice totally ditched Dante to go chill in the Celestial Rose. Remind me again why Dante liked her so much? Anyway, the old guy in question is St. Bernard, who for the purposes of this review will be represented as a dog. And he points out some of the dudes chilling on the rose, which includes an alarming number of children. Bernard explains that before Big J was born, all kids were guaranteed a spot in heaven. But after hey. he was born, they had to be baptized and, if male, circumcised, mm. or they'd get tossed into limbo, which, just a reminder, yeah. is in hell. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Jesus. But Dante's running out of pages, so it's time to meet God face to face. But this part yes. is so bright that Dante can't it's properly God. remember it, which might explain why it's so weird. So first off, I want you to imagine God for me. Okay. Get a really clear image in your head of what you think mm. the big guy looks like. You got it? Great. Yeah. You're wrong. God is, in fact, three glowing circles occupying the same space, one each for the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So ah, that incidentally means the five glowing amen. rings is, in fact, Jesus, just like everything else in this book. Oh, but we're not done yet. In case you're not confused enough already, at the center of those rings is a book, and it's bound by a book. Love. So yeah, God is also a book. 
It's just got like four dimensions of meta. There are also rainbows because of course there yeah. are. So in conclusion, God is a circle full of book and rainbows. Mm -hmm. Wait, wait, wait one sec. Wait, are you yeah. telling me God is a reading rainbow? Oh, oh my God, my childhood just got so much more. Oh my God, God, you're right. So guys, that's it for the video. Hope you like the one I did by myself. Post down in the comments which one you thought was the best. Me or mine. Mine is better. Comment me. Or both. Comment both. If you say both. Anyway, goodbye, Jolteon. Wait, what? Evie? Evie? Don't. Evie? No! No! Evie! Evie, no! Evie, open up this door! No, I'm locking you out. No! <laughs>